Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 28th season, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. We also have had on other brands of artists. We've had on musicians, uh, actors, sculptors. It's a pretty wide net. So if you have an idea for an artist who might be good for the writer's block, a writer or other variety, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be glad to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of Cape Ann TV for and about Cape Ann is a result of cable access television. It's a wonderful cultural asset, and you don't get it by subscribing to DISH. So watch out for those ads, and don't be sucked in. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to say tonight we do have two writers, and they are multiply talented. They are both writers, poet, short story writer, both professors, but they also are filmmakers. So we get to talk to, uh, to them about dual or even triple talent creativity tonight. They are Rod Kessler and, uh, I almost said Brooklyn, he's from Brooklyn originally, Rod Kessler and Kevin Carey. Rod and Kevin, welcome to the Writer's Block. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming down from Salem. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start with just some general intro material. Rod, can you tell us where, where you came out of, where you're from? Well, uh, most recently I, I live in Salem, where I'm um, I, I taught at Salem State for 31 years. I've been retired for three, but I began life in Brooklyn and eventually found my way to Hartford and then uh, Cambridge and now Salem. So I guess I'm migrating in this direction. With any luck, I'll end up in Cape Ann. <laughs> good, good. Uh, I was just going to say you're probably going to stay in Salem, huh? but I think that would be a step up, Cape Ann. Yeah. Kevin, can you tell me something about your background? Where yeah, are you from? I grew up in uh, Revere, Massachusetts, and uh, like Rod, and crawled my way up the coast a little bit, and um, here I am in uh, Manchester now. We lived for many years in Beverly, and uh, you, in you, you're, you're living in Manchester or Beverly? Manchester Man by the sea, now, Manchester. And, uh, but for 15 years, I lived in Beverly. And you teach at Salem State. And I teach at Salem State. And yes. you are retired from Salem State. Right. And I assume that's where you met. I, I was a student in uh, Rod's class. I had two young children, decided to go back to school, and uh, we were taking all these creative writing classes with uh, Professor Kessler. And that's how so you, you must have done well. Uh, I did okay. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was know? a long time ago. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think either of us could have you know, predicted that we would end up being collaborators all these years later, on a film about an obscure, eccentric poet. <laughs> yeah, and we were colleagues for a while at Salem That's State true. after we, uh, the professor-student relationship. Now, uh, Rod just hinted that our main topic here is a documentary that you both uh, created called Unburying Malcolm Miller, an hour-long documentary in color with a little smattering of black and white for effect. Mm -hmm. And it's about this obscure, eccentric poet. I want to know how you first conceived this idea. Uh, Kevin, give me, let me start with you. Well, um, Rod can tell the backstory in Malcolm Miller, but there was a reading that Rod put together at, at Mass Poetry of Malcolm Miller's poems. And he asked me to be one of the readers. And uh, after we we read around the poems, people started telling stories about Malcolm's life. And uh, uh, they were interesting and some strange, some a little weird. Some strange. Uh, and uh, I, I approached Rod after the reading and said, well, this, this might make an interesting film. So we So at the first meeting, at that, at that, that reading. that, that yeah. idea come up. And, uh, and we had a few meetings after that and discussed it. and. Off we went. So you were already on to this obscure That's eccentric right. poet. I was already working on a project to preserve the best of his poetry. And um, I'd been fairly far along in that road when we um, proposed a session at the Mass Poetry Festival to read his poems and talk about him. But um, he 
his, his story is so interesting, you can't hear the details without getting drawn in. Uh, I mean, after all, he was eccentric, he was homeless for some long periods of his life, and he, he died unattended, alone, in public housing in Salem, um, on the floor, surrounded by empty bottles of Tylenol, suggesting that he'd been in some pain towards the end of his life. And, and, and you tell the story in, and I, I won't repeat it all, you tell the story in the documentary about right. you used to get these anonymous poems. These books of his. Books requesting that you buy one. That's right. If you like these, he would say, please send $5. And there was an address in Salem, a Pioneer Terrace, uh, public housing. And um, it took me a long time to get around to actually reading his poetry because I was um, a little snobbish towards self-publishing in those days. And um, as the film makes clear, when I did start to read him, I was impressed enough to um, want to know him better. And um, I did meet him in the last year of his life. I managed to get him published legitimately in Soundings East, which is the literary magazine of Salem State. Uh -huh and in a sense became his editor. But the funny thing is that he listed me as his emergency contact, unbeknownst to me, and so when he was found dead, who should get the call to deal with it but me? And so I felt like I inherited this role. I want to hold up both uh, the poem, the book of poems, the chapbook of poems that accompanies the documentary the DVD documentary, and then I'll hold up the documentary itself. Now, Unburying Malcolm Miller, uh, the poems. These are the poems that are read by various poets in the documentary. Now I want to show you the black and white cover of the DVD cover, uh, Burying Malcolm Miller, a little difficult <laughs> to see. <laughs> What, what un, the bury, unburying of Malcolm Miller, a little bit difficult to read, uh, but you can find it at the website that is being supered during the program, that is uh, Kevin Carey's uh, website, and uh, pick up a copy. Kevin, uh, did you, after you talked to Rod, after this reading, uh, when did the meeting start, and what was the approximate date of the start of those meetings? Well, the uh, Mass Poetry Festival, I think, was in May that year, too, right? right? Yeah. It wasn't long it after we, that yeah. we met. It must have been May 2015. Yeah. yeah. So um, it was pretty soon after, I think, a few weeks after we sat yeah. down for coffee or something, one of many times. And uh, I had done a documentary a few years ago about a New Jersey poet. Her name was uh, Maria Maziotti Gillen, and she's alive and well, <laughs> unlike uh, Malcolm. Um, and uh, so I, I had a partner in this filmmaking uh, poetry documentary world, and uh, he's a New Jersey photographer named Mark Helringhouse. And uh, I ran the idea by him, and Rod sent him some poems, and uh, we, we kind of collectively decided that uh, th this was a good idea. So we uh, started to get a little conceptual about it, about what we thought it might look like, uh, we wanted to showcase Salem as well as Malcolm the poet yeah. and the man. And um, we also decided that we wanted uh, local poets to read his work at Salem kind of landmark spots, you know. Uh, before the show, Rod, you yeah. mentioned that in many ways this is about Salem because he was a artifact of Salem. Right. He was born in Salem yeah. and spent uh, all of his life here except for a few times when he would he was in the Navy, he traveled in Europe, and he went to college at McGill and would often go back to Montreal. He was a, a friend and, I think, McGill classmate of Leonard Cohen, and um, he would sometimes stay on Leonard Cohen's couch when he went to Montreal. So, as I said, his story is interesting. It is an interesting story. Uh, we're going to give our viewers a sense of the documentary by showing them the first almost three minutes, uh, that gives a flavor, a visual flavor, because there's some Salem shots, and there's some nice photography tricks going from black and white to color, and a poem or two. And uh, we'll show that uh, right now, the first 250 of Unburying Malcolm Miller. Let's uh, look at that right now. <laughs> 
Good night, Irene. I have a cousin, Irene. She often stands downtown with a severe condemnatory look as if the world has disappointed her. She doesn't know who Walt Whitman is. If she did, he could be in for a real good talking to. In the early 1990s, it's probably 1992, I started receiving in my English department mailbox at Salem State these uh, envelopes containing a cheap looking self published book of poems with a handwritten note saying, If you like these, send $5, please, to a name and an address. The name was Malcolm Miller. In those days, I was a little disdainful of self-publication. It certainly hadn't become as popular as it is today. And um, I wasn't interested, and I basically put these books aside. But I thought, if you're going to have to beg for your livelihood, you could do worse than using poetry. So I'd always send off the $5 to this Malcolm Miller with a Salem address. And sure enough, a few months later, another book would come. And so it would go for years. And um, I don't know what prompted me over 10 or 20 years later to um, look through some of these books. But to my surprise, I found he was a very good poet. Good. Now, we heard Rod say he was a very good poet. <laughs> Is that immediately obvious? Or do you have to understand his personality first? Do, do, do you look at the poems? Can they stand alone? Oh, I think absolutely. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I fell in love with the poems long before I met him or had any sense of him as a person. He was just a name to me, Malcolm Miller. And um, whatever mental image that conjured up for me was nothing like the person I met when I rang the doorbell in public housing and this old man came and opened it. Kevin, you are yeah, I was, you're, I was you're a poet. With the poems you're a right poet. So yeah. were you impressed with him? Yeah, and uh, you know, you, you talk to people about his poetry, and I think a uh, 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 general comment that people seem to have is that he he was an outsider poet. Uh, I know one poet uh, that we spoke to about said uh, you can tell this guy w wasn't in an MFA program somewhere. <laughs> You know, that his poems were uh, kind of from the street and from taken from real life, and uh, they weren't affected in uh, ways that some uh, academic institutions might gear <laughs> poetry to. But you know, for better or worse, uh, they, they were different. It was just to say he had yeah. an originality to him, but it would be a mistake to consider him untrained or, or in any sense of a primitive. He was well educated. He was familiar with a great many poets whose uh, names and stories sometimes crop into the poems. And you know, he went to St. John's Prep. He went to McGill. He was educated. His, his use of English is nearly flawless. And I've read through his uh, essentially 61 books. Um, so what he's doing, he's not a grandma Moses of poetry. Mm -hmm. But he is original. And so he was, he was a, uh, 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 I don't know, he went to St. John's Prep, so he was a trailblazer for you in a sense. In, 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 <laughs> yeah. In, 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 yeah, maybe in, in more ways than one who knows. Yeah. Uh, I but, have to, I, when I got the book, I read the book, and 
I didn't know how to react. I wasn't, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't think it was bad in any sense, but I wasn't blown away either. Then I watched the documentary, I went back, and I got into it, as they say, a little, uh, uh, a little deeper. He's pretty good. Yeah, he is, he is. He's, uh, I think he's, there's, a, there's a few different facets to him, I think, that, that make him an interesting poet. You know, when you look at, I haven't begun to survey the amount of work that Rod has of him, but in the, in the uh, you know, selection of it that I've seen, he, d he does quite a few things well. You know, I, I the, think he's um, got a cynical view of the world sometimes, but at other times he's got this uh, wonderful sense of nature, and, uh, <coughs> you know, um, and he's, you know, not averse to writing poems about uh, uh, women that he liked or uh, people that maybe he didn't like. That's true. You know, so uh, I think all that makes him a pretty. Uh, pretty interesting. Uh, that that's a good uh, place where I can I can jump off from that. People he didn't like. There are interviews with people in the documentary who did not like him. In fact, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. they state that fairly strongly. <laughs> uh, he was not, I guess, often an easy person to like. Uh, the inclusion of all those interviews makes the documentary, I think, very interesting and intriguing. You don't know if this guy's worth my trouble or not. He sounds like so, 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 so be. Uh, why did you combine all of those diverse attitudes towards him? I'm going to turn to I, Kevin on I, that one since he's well, the Well, you know, I, I, I don't think we went into the documentary with an agenda on who this person was. Uh, we let the people who had stories about him put forth their evidence and um, let the viewer decide who they thought he was. And, and I mean that not to be cute or anything. That's really how it happened. We, we had no footage of Malcolm. We had no interviews of him. We had no footage of him reading poetry. So uh, the only way we were going to define who this person was was through the stories of other people and through the poetry. So. It made perfect sense to get all sides of that story, you know. And uh, I have to say that made the documentary seem to me a very legitimate documentary. Yeah, I think if, because if, it's balanced if and we it's objective. Hadn't, then you run the risk of just creating a nice nostalgic piece about a poet. A puff. We, we, yeah, we, we, we were interested in the truth. Yeah. And I think you know it may not be a uh, definitive truth because it depends on how you look at it, but. I think the uh, the sides were well represented. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you've mentioned to me before the show, and also I believe it's in the documentary that you have the best collection of <laughs> Miller poetry outside of McGill University's library. <laughs> is, is that that is in the documentary? That's isn't true. That? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when did you? Or when did you? I know you started getting these uh, these uh, anonymous. Uh, well, I can answer that. When did you decide first to pursue this guy? Um, I think I decided to pursue him um, in, in, in 2013 when I decided that he was a great poet and wanted to have his poems in the literary magazine that I was involved with, Soundings East. Um, he had sent me books over the years that I hadn't really paid any attention to, but I'd sent in my $5, and they kept coming, and I, I never threw them out. The one you have for the movie is $5, well, and it's a replica these, these of his These are the, of his, the uh, actual his ones, own. but we, we made these to look like it. Anyway, um, I, 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 so he, it turns out that he had um, altogether, um, I think, 61 books. That's a lot. I estimate around 3,500 poems. The first two were legitimately published in Canada by a press called Tundra. One of them was very expensively done. But he turned his back on legitimate publishing and produced um, essentially 59 more um, of these self-produced poetry books. Now, I probably had 15 or 20, but when I finally met him and carried in 10 copies of Soundings East with his poems in it, he gave me a lot more. And then when he was dead and the city of Salem needed his apartment cleared out for the next public uh, tenant, I saved the rest from the trash bin, uh, in addition to uh, manuscripts of his and some of his personal effects. But um, so I felt destined to be the, um, 
collector of these. And uh, I have also sort of done a, I hope, painstaking job of tracking down who all else has copies of his books to put together an index of how many are out there and who has them. Now, that's inevitably going to be incomplete, but consider this. His last books, which were published by, um, or printed by Deschamps in Salem, had a press run of 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so some of these are <laughs> 15. 15, They're pretty rare. And, um, and yet, I think well, he had in his mind where they were going, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, 15 lucky people out there. Or libraries, mm -hmm. you know, the Peabody oh, Essex, uh, the Phillips Library got them, the McGill Library got them, Salem Public Library got them, Salem State Library got them. In fact, um, one interesting story I heard from the director of the Salem Public Library is one time they got an angry letter from Malcolm Miller saying, you know, I, I sent you this book, and you never paid me. And they looked through their records and said, oh, we're terribly sorry, but we never received it. Could you send us another copy? And he just went, you know, ballistic on that. And they didn't understand why. And he was saying, well, you know, McGill paid me and they paid me. Well, I'm guessing that he didn't have another copy. That, you know, he had a copy earmarked for them and he wasn't <laughs> going to get. And, you know, he charged me $5, but he charged his libraries more. Well, sure. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, yes. Rod just used a term, very striking term called Malcolm Miller a great poet. You're a poet. Does that sit well with you? That's, yeah, that, that's I, pretty, I, that's a high bar. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think what makes a great poet, you know, uh, I, I think to my mind it's uh, poetry uh, that's accessible, that's of the people, that um, uh, has, uh, you know, a diverse palette of topics to it. Uh, it, it, it all, it, so I, I'd say that's, that's great, you know. Um, but like any poet, not everyone's going to like him. And not yeah. everyone's going to love he's him. He's accessible. He's yeah, and yeah. you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot <coughs> going on in his poetry that's uh, worthy of being read. And I, I suppose that would, that would make it great in my book, you know. It's a high bar. It's, it's, it's good. I um, I had not heard of him until uh, I talked to Rod about him, and um, uh, I'm glad I have uh, now heard of him. Uh, I want to get before we uh, begin to close out uh, some nuts and bolts about making a movie, hmm. because you are filmmakers, and cinema is uh, an art. Well, I, I think the first thing you need is in somebody like Rod, who's, uh, you know, this movie's as much about Rod's journey with Malcolm as it is about Malcolm. So I, I think that helped us out in designing the movie because we got to learn about Rod's relationship with him and, and how that came to be and Rod's uh, mission of putting all this poetry together and finding, you know, legitimate well, publication for it. And let me get some more detail on that. It says... <clears throat> this is a North of Boston production. I guess that's you two. Now, um, let's clarify. Kevin is the filmmaker and so is Mark Hillringhouse. I'm more in front of the camera than behind He's the star. Well, he, he's the okay. filmmaker. Oh, so you're the, you're the producer mm -hmm. and you're the talent. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, so the, it says on the jacket, a North of Boston production, written, produced, and directed by Kevin Carey and Mark Hillringhouse, who is not with us here today, with, new sentence, new fragment, with... Rod Kessler. So that's kind of a mysterious uh, attribution there, with yeah. Rod Kessler. Well, it, be, because, right, oh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Rod had a lot to do with uh, organizing, setting people up, as well as being in the film, and being part of the motivation for the film. And so, I interview a lot of the people what, who speak. Yeah. Well, you're the narrator. Well, there's no uh, real narration so much as, um, you know, there's, there, are, there are voices, but in some of the scenes when we have people who knew him, I'm interviewing them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the, the the portion we ran, you are the uh, yeah. We interviewed Rod, and Rod interviewed everybody else. <laughs> so and, uh, you are. So it was a really it was a really uh, group effort. You know, yeah, did you have to, Did you form a nonprofit uh, to produce this? Is, is North of, North of Boston a Nonprofit entity? It's <laughs> not a nonprofit. No, in terms we're, of it's we're, not a legal, a legal, <laughs> formally nonprofit. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> my standing joke is that if you if you want to make less money than writing poetry, 
get into poetry documentaries. <laughs> so yeah. it is a nonprofit in a sense, but not. Uh, yeah. not I often legal. tell people when they ask me why I write poetry, I, tell, <laughs> I got in it for the money. You know, uh, you know it's it's uh, this project fell in our lap, as did the last one we did, because we were friends with uh, uh, the poet that that one was about, and. Uh, it, we're happy to have done it, but it was a really, when I say a group effort, you know, a lot of the poets that read in the movie were grips that were holding mics. Or, so did everybody know. volunteer? Yeah, it was just a really, everybody came together that was involved in it and, you know, on a shoestring budget. Really so, yeah, effort. what was, if you had to estimate the budget, Ooh, I don't what know was the total, total cost? Time. Uh, you know, most of it was time, some travel expense. Uh, everything's shot digitally now, so you're not wasting anything. Um, you got to get a new you know, lens. <laughs> we, we, I, I did have to get a new lens, but I wanted one anyway because we the lens fell and broke one day while we were shooting. But um, uh, I had the equipment anyways because I've been doing this off and on for a few years. Uh -huh. So really, it's it's like time. Uh, so uh, maybe two thousand dollars in cash and eight thousand dollars in volunteer. Time. There's a lot of there's a lot more volunteer money than uh, anything. I mean, people just gave of themselves and made this happen in a lot of different so ways. I think, I think we we do get uh, uh, people who call in or write to me and they want to know. Well, that person who was on the show self-published. How much did that cost? You know, because they're thinking about it, but they don't yeah, have any money. Yeah. So I want to. I'd say some, we easily spent a few thousand dollars. A few thousand, and then triple or quadruple that in volunteer. Help yeah, would I mean, have been uh, if, if would have been built at that man or woman hours it would add up. <clears throat> uh, but um, you know, I you know the problem is with these things is once they get going, you can't stop them. They kind yeah, of once you're committed, and own. they go, uh oh, and there's somebody else to interview, or there's yeah. you know another idea, or uh, there's something else we could get, and then so, allowing for the uh, time that we uh, yeah. showed the uh, film, we're almost out of. Uh, out of the half hour, but I want to ask you very briefly, do you have another poet in mind for your next documentary? Either of you. Uh, Kevin first and then Rod. Well, Mark and I did an interview with Gerald Stern. In, yeah, uh, how'd you snag Gerald New York, Stern? Uh, recently, we were there for two days. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Gerald's 92 years old now, so we just wanted to get him because he's a friend of Mark's. And, uh, I was impressed that you had uh, Gerald Yeah, Stern so he big, liked Malcolm big, Miller's big gun. poems very much, uh. and he agreed to do a little cameo in the, in the end of the film. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if my poetry uh, documentary uh, role is going to continue or not. But, what about uh, you, Rod? Do you have any poets in mind? Or? Well, keep in mind, I'm not the filmmaker, and of course I stumbled onto this Malcolm Miller project without knowing what it was going to grow into. So I'm just going to have to leave it at that. Who knows, you know, what will cross my path in that respect. Well, you can walk and, around uh, the cemeteries and see if there's anybody else you can <laughs> unbury. <laughs> well, keep this in mind, too, that, you know, I have to read Malcolm Miller's correspondence with uh, Vince Farini, and I know films have already been made about him. But yes. Who knows? Uh, we are out of time. I want to thank you, Rod Kessler and Kevin Carey, for being with us, talking about unburying Malcolm Miller his poetry, the documentary, and thank you very much for being with us and coming down tonight. Well, thank thank you. you, John. That's I fine. want to thank you in the TV land very much for being with us. If you've learned something about this very interesting, good uh, Salem poet, Malcolm Miller, and the people who love his poetry, Kevin Carey and Rod Kessler among them, then the writer's block has done its job. I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. <laughs>